Um, but if you've got a Bible or a Bible, uh, when we were talking about the Feast of Unleavened, looking at verses 7 through 23. So let's pick it up. <clears throat> then came the day of Unleavened. Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the, into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room that I may eat? I'll show you a large furnished upper room. There make ready. So they went and they found him. He sat down and the 12 apostles with him. I will no longer eat of it. And he gave thanks and he said, take this comes. And he took the bread and he gave him. And likewise, he also took the cup after supper. There is with me on the table. And truly the son of by whom the son is betrayed. Then they begin to question among themselves, which of them, and so, Father, as we, the, the Lord's Supper, as it's called, the Passover, uh, communion, we pray that you would prepare our hearts to, to receive of you this morning. But, Lord, that we would really enter into it through your word this morning. And so we seek you and we worship you. And it's in Jesus' name. And everyone say it. Amen. <coughs> if I can get, like, maybe just one more little nudge on the, on the volume there. Um. So the, the title of our message this morning as we, finish, as we go through Luke chapter 22 is first, now speaking of first communion, I heard how the first graders in her class, for those, and, and, and how, how solemn of an occasion this was and that they need to take it seriously. Well, on the day of, uh, during the service, little Johnny was up in the front row and he's, and he's talking and he's giggling and he's joking around and he's standing up and, and, he's, and he's drawing all this attention to himself. And Sister Margaret, she, she can't handle it anymore. So finally, she, she sends another little boy, and she tells him to go up front, and she says, you know what, you go up front, and you tell that long-winded jokester uh, that he's been talking long enough, and it's time for him to sit down and shut up. So <coughs> the little boy goes up, and he goes all the way up to the front, but then he grabs the robe of the priest, and he says, you long-winded jokester, you've been up here talking long enough, it's time to sit down and shut up. Now, we know that, that some traditions, of course, you know, that practice what's called First Communion. In fact, when I was seven years old and lived with my grandparents for about a year, I was a part of one of those traditions. But, of course, here, here at Calvary, we do not practice, quote-unquote, First Communion, right? So this morning, when we're talking about First Communion, uh, really what we're talking about is the very first communion, the original communion, the very first time anybody ever had communion. And, of course, it took place right here, in Luke chapter 22 in what's called the Passover feast. And so this morning, <clears throat> we're going to be learning about communion as we talk about the Passover. In fact, there are three things, if you're taking notes, there are three things that we're going to discover this morning about the Passover. We're going to look, number one, at Passover past, Passover past. Number two, we're going to be looking at Passover present, Passover present. And then number three, we'll be looking at Passover future, future. Kind of sounds like Christmas, right? Christmas past, Christmas present, so on and so forth. And so as we look at these, we chances are will be deceived. Let's pick it up in verse 7 and look. For <coughs> <coughs> That's in the Greek. Soon I'll give you the Hebrew. Uh, verse 7. <coughs> then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. Then he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. And, and so they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And so he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him, then he will show you a large un... So they went, and they found it, just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. <laughs> Here we're looking at the Passover feast. We need to put ourselves in, in the disciples' sandals for just a moment, in the disciples' robes for just a moment. And so to do that, we need to remember what the Passover really was. And of course, we know that the, the Passover has its roots. In Exodus chapter 12, Moses, you know, they, they go back and forth, and he says, Let, and yet each time Pharaoh refused, God sent a plague on Egypt. Now this happened not once, not twice, but it happened 10 times different times. <clears throat> Ten different times. And of course, the, the, the tenth plague that God sent on, on, on the land was called the plague of the death of the firstborn, where, where the firstborn in every house would be slain, would, would be killed. In fact, <coughs> uh, God even told Moses, God told Moses that 
that the only way that, that Moses' people, that is the only way that the Jewish people would be exempt from this plague themselves was, was if they were to take a lamb without spot or blemish and then it was a substitute for their first, the place of their firstborn. So they were to take this lamb, sacrifice it, and then take its blood and then wipe the blood of that lamb on the doorpost of their home. Then they would cook the lamb in bitter herbs and then eat that with, with unleavened bread. <clears throat> now, of course, we know what the unleavened bread is, right? That's the, the Jewish matzo bread. It's what we often use when we have communion here. You know, that, that flat bread, really dry and hard stuff. You know, it has the whole having his, his lunch during Passover week at the park. And so he's having lunch, and he, and he pulls out uh, some, of that, some of that matzo, uh, some of that, 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 that unleavened bread. And so as he's eating it, all of a sudden this blind man comes and sits down next to him. He thought, well, you know, I don't want to be rude. So he pulls out another sheet of that of that matzo, that unleavened bread, you know, with all the holes and everything in it. And then he hands it to the blind guy, and the blind guy's holding it. And on onto it, finally he looks up and he says, who wrote this garbage? Uh, you know, with the holes. And, anyway, true story. <clears throat> so they would eat this lamb with, with the unleavened bread. And, and then remember, that night, that's when the angel of death came. And, and, and he came to every house, and, and the firstborn in every house was taken, unless... He came to a house, and there was blood covering that house. And so any house that was covered under the blood, the angel of death would pass over that house. God's wrath passed over that house. Moses to have the people commemorate the month of, of Nisan, the 14th, <coughs> from the 14th Passover, seven days. And you have to understand that, that, the, that, the, that, the, that to the Jew, even there's a, a, a big deal. In fact, beasts. Now, a pilgrimage feast within a 20-mile radius traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast. And, and, and yet, the, the Passover, uh, that this was the most important of the pilgrimage feasts. This is why even to this day, Jewish people, Poland, wherever they are, whenever they celebrate the Passover feast, they always end with a toast saying, next year in Jerusalem. Because their heart was, was to go and celebrate there. <coughs> Pardon me. So, with that as our backdrop, with that as the setting, now, now these two, and, and, and they asked Jesus, where do you want us to go and prepare the Passover? But they're about to discover that, that Jesus already had everything planned, right? And you're going to see this certain man. He's going to be carrying a, a jug of water on his head. Now listen, that would have been a definite sign in that day. Because listen, in, in that culture, men did not carry water. The women did. You know, we've all seen these pictures in the Middle East of, of women with the big jugs of, of, of water carrying on, on their head. And so be, that was because the, the women were the ones <coughs> who would go to the well, draw the water, and then carry it back, not the men. And so a guy like this would have stood out. I mean, it'd be like saying, you know what? Look for the guy carrying a purse. Excuse me, that is a, that is a, a, a man bag. Whatever, it's a purse. It's a jar of water on his head. He knew where this man was. He knew what was going. Jesus knew every detail. And I point that out, by the way, because, you know, we often say the devil is in the details. Well, I beg your pardon, but you know what? No, he isn't. The devil's not in the details. God is in the details. God's in the details. Because the truth is, is that just as the Lord had every single detail of this Passover planned out, and prepared for life planned. He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. He has a plan for your thing. We want to know everything. I want to know every detail. Listen, that's not what the Bible says, is it? The Bible doesn't say <clears throat> that, that, that when you walk through life, yeah, you, you'll know every single detail ahead of time, that you'll walk through life and you'll have the whole plan, the five-year plan. No, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, that we walk by faith, not by sight. We don't have the five-year plan. We don't have every single detail. In fact, check this out. Oftentimes when it comes to God's plan for our life, typically at a time, one step at a time, step number one. And so, if you're, and so it's step by step. We walk by faith. <coughs> I love the way uh, J. Oswald Sanders put it years ago. And he talked about this woman who, who was giving her testimony at, at a conference. And she was talking about God's will for her life and God's plan. And she stood up and she, she held up this, this blank sheet of paper. 
and, and, and it was completely blank. And she held it up and she said, this sheet of paper contains God's plan. Only thing on it was, well, well, you know what? I've accepted when I've signed my name to it. It's a detailed plan when it came to this Passover. So now we've looked at Passover past, how it was back in the days of Moses when it first started. Now, before we get to Passover present, however, first we see in verse 14 that, that, that we see Jesus has a craving. Is a craving for, for the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him, and then he said to them, with fervent desire, for I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks. And we'll pause there. Um, let me ask you this. Show of hands, how many of you ever had a craving? You ever just have a crazy craving for something? You know, now ch chances are, if, you, if you're like me, if you have a, a teenage son uh, who's always hungry, uh, you've seen what cravings look like, right? Like the other night, my son and I were, were driving, and all of a sudden he starts talking about Bubba Chino's. He's like, he's like, you know, it felt like I was driving in the car with Rain Man. It was like, Bubba Chino's this and Bubba Chino's that. You know, Bubba Chino's has green chili. Bubba Chino's has, has great burritos. Bubba Chino's has Brent was having a Bubba Chino's craving. You know, the classic example of the pregnant lady you know, who craves something crazy. You know, the, the stereotypic pickles and ice cream. Although when my wife was pregnant, I was the one with the craving. Ice cream every day. She, you know, she, she had the baby, I gained the weight. I don't know what happened there. And, and who among us has not ever had a, 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 a craving for a midnight snack? Ever get your sweet tooth on? Or all of a sudden, you go to Krispy Kreme, the, the light's on, it says hot, fresh. You, you got your sweet tooth on. In fact, the other day I read about a, a true eating disorder, uh, an eating disorder where, where people have these cravings for things that aren't even food. They, they, they crave, literally, they crave eating chalk and dirt and ice. It's, it's a true eating disorder. In fact, the other day I heard of a guy who, who, who couldn't sleep, and so he went to the doctor, and the doctor could weight like crazy, like five pounds a week. And so he, he couldn't figure out what was going on. So the doctors, they set up these video cameras to, to record him to, to see what his sleep patterns were at night. And they discovered that at night, he would get up in the middle of the night and sleepwalk. And he would walk from his bed to the kitchen, open up the refrigerator, and then eat an entire whole stick of butter every single night. Yeah, that is weird. And I bring this up because, because here it seems, as, as we look at verse 15, it seems that Jesus had a craving. As he says, he says, it's with fervent desire that I've desired, is here, <coughs> in strong craving. So Jesus is saying, you know, I've had this, this strong craving, this, this urge. I am jonesing for this meal. I, I've, I've had this urge to eat this meal with you. Now, by the way, I think that this is talking about more than just the meal itself. Okay, in that day, <coughs> they won with each other. They, they, they believed that when you took the loaf of bread and you broke off a piece of it for yourself and then gave the loaf to the next person next to you, they believed that a part of you remained on that loaf. And so literally, the next person not only got a piece of bread, but they got a piece of you as well. And so they believed that by breaking bread together, you became one with each other. And so it could be about this meal. Maybe saying, you know what, I, I desire to, to be one with you. I desire to break bread with you and, and have, have fellowship with you and become close to you and, and become one with you. I, I want closeness with you. And so every time we take communion today, among other things, communion is a reminder that the Lord wants intimacy. The Lord wants closeness with you. Now, some of you hear that and you think, oh, man, that is awesome. Others of us hear that and we're like, oh, man, that is freaky. Because some of us God and, and all of that, but we're going we're to keep our looks between how men and women worship. This illustration was going to be a lot better before I lost my voice, because now I can't do my, my women worshiping impersonation, because now they're going to sound like Froggy from the Little Rascals worshiping. So just use your imagination. But, but the comedian, uh, Christian comedian Tim Hawkins, he's like, I want to touch your face. And, and the guy's like, his face? It's creepy. 
I mean, can't we just sing a song, something like, you know, watch the game with me, Lord. But, but listen, the Lord's Supper, as it's called, communion, as we call it, is a reminder that, that he desires oneness with us, relationship with us. He, he, he doesn't just want us to go to church. He doesn't just want us to go through the motions. He doesn't just want us to, to, to sit in a chair and do a ritual. He actually wants a relationship with you, a personal relationship with you. And communion reminds us of this. And so now with that, now let's pick it up in verse 17 and talk about Passover. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks. For I say to you that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And, and truly, the Son of Man goes as it's been determined, but woe to him among themselves. Uh, which of them it was who would do this thing? So now we're talking about Passover. And for us to really understand Passover present, when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Now the word remembrance, by the way, in the original, is, is a word that literally is translated memorial. Do this as, as a memorial to me. In other words, this, this is an object lesson that every time you do it, it reminds you of what I've done, Jesus is saying. It's a memorial. It's an object lesson. Now, with that, by the way, if you're taking notes, and, and you should be, by the way, <laughs> if you're taking notes, let me say that, that there are three major views when it comes to communion. Three major views. I think we have a slide for that. And I think it's spelled correctly. Transubstantiation. Now, th now our Catholic friends, this is, this is the view that they would hold to. Now, this is basically a view that, that basically says that those elements, you know, the, the bread, and then in their case, the, the wine, those elements, uh, w when you take them, they say those literally become the quote-unquote real presence of Jesus. Well, what they say is, is that when the priest prays, all of a sudden something mystical happens. And literally, the, 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 the bread literally becomes the body of Jesus. And then when the priest prays, literally, the, the wine now literally becomes the, the blood of Jesus. Now, the problem with that view, now there's a lot of problems with that view, but one of the problems with that view is, is that basically what you're saying is that every time you take communion, Jesus is dying again. That his, his body is being pierced again for our transgressions sins. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, or again and again and again, every time we take communion, you're taking notes, and you know who you are, because there's only three of you. Uh, <laughs> I can see. <laughs> Just letting you know. I, I know who's taking notes and who isn't. Um, but but the, the second view is, is consubstantiation. Sounds similar, but it's different. Consubstantiation. Now, this is the view that our, our Lutheran and, and our Episcopalian friends would hold to. Now, unlike the other view, the wine or the juice or whatever, and the bread, they don't literally become the, the physical presence of Jesus, but instead, something spiritual happens. They would say that, that spiritually, Jesus' body now fills the bread, and spiritually, Jesus' blood fills the wine. Now, that's called consubstantiation. But then there's a third view. And this is the view that, that we here at Calvary hold to. It's not just us at Calvary Chapel. You know, thousands and millions of Christians all over the world hold to this view. And this is the view called the memorial view. Memorial. Now we get that, that name right here in this passage. When Jesus said in verse 19, do this in remembrance of me. And as we said, that word remembrance literally is memorial. Do this as a memorial of me. Do this as, as, as something that reminds you, an object lesson that reminds you what I've done for you. And so every time we, 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 we take that bread, that bread's just, it, it's, it's nothing special. It's not his actual body. It's not spiritually his body. It's just bread. But every time we take that bread, it's an object lesson that reminds us that his body was broken for us, pierced for our transgressions. And the same thing with the juice. Every time we take that cup, it reminds us that his blood was shed for us. Now, of course, there's, 
there's a lot of debate in the, in the Christian community, you know, about whether or not we should use wine or grape juice for communion. You know, because on the one hand, there, there'll be those who say, well, you know, we should use wine because that's what Jesus and the disciples used. They used wine. And that's true. But keep in mind that, that the wine back in their day was less than 2% alcohol. Less than 2%. Just keep that in mind. But then on the other hand, uh, there are those who, who, who would say, well, you know what? Anything alcoholic is, is sinful, so therefore we shouldn't have it at all. And so they argue, and they go back and forth, taste great, less filling, taste great, less, and they go back and forth. In fact, back in the early 19th century, there, there was a medical doctor who, who was also a devout Methodist, and he happened to believe that alcohol was a sin. In fact, he, he believed this so strongly that he, he actually developed a way to, to, to pasteurize grape juice so that it would not ferment. To, to pasteurize grape juice so it could not ferment. And then he would then serve that grape juice at his church for communion service. Now, by the way, the name of this medical doctor who, who developed this way to pasteurize grape juice, his name was Dr. Thomas Welch. Now, a little bit later, uh, his, his grandson then patented this, started up a company called Welch's Grape Juice. It's a true story. Now, some of you may be happy to hear that for communion later this morning, we, we might be serving Welch's Grape Juice. <laughs> but Jesus, he, he takes this cup. And he, says, he says, this cup is the new covenant. Not the old covenant. The new covenant in my blood. Now, what does this mean? When, you know, when we hear that word covenant, you know, a lot of times we, we, we think of a legal contract, right? And, and that's what it was. It was a legal contract, but it was much, much more than that. Much deeper than just that. In fact, the word covenant itself really is a Hebrew word that, that literally means to cut. To cut. Because when covenants were made, something had to bleed. And so whenever a covenant was made, there, there was always an animal sacrifice. For example, when a peace treaty was drawn up between two enemies, oftentimes what would happen is, is they would take an animal and they would cut it in half right down the spine and then split it in half. And then the two parties that were, that were entering into this covenant, this peace treaty with each other, they would then walk between those two animal halves, kind of like they were an, an aisle way to walk through. And as they walked between those two animal halves, they would get sprayed by, by, by the blood. They'd get all this splatter all over them. But symbolically, this was their way of saying, that, 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 you know what, if I ever do anything to, to break my end of this deal, if I ever do anything to violate my end of this covenant, this, this, this contract, then may what was done to this animal be done to me. And so in those days, covenants were for life until death did you part. It's now in the same way. <coughs> Back in Exodus chapter 12. Back in Exodus chapter 12, when, when God delivered the children of Israel, he, he, what he did was he made a covenant promise with the children of Israel. He promised to deliver them. He promised to, 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 to set them free from their slavery. But then to solidify his promise, to, to solidify his contract, to make it legal and binding, something had to be cut. So they, they, they sacrificed a lamb, as we mentioned. Then they took the blood of that lamb, wiped it on their doorpost. And then when the angel of death came, whenever he saw the blood on that doorpost, door he would pass over. God's wrath passed over them. And so now, Jesus takes, at the, at, the, at the Passover table, Jesus takes that cup. And he says, you know what? This cup that used to represent the Passover, this cup that used to represent that lamb that was sacrificed so, so that you could enter into a covenant relationship with God. He says, now this is a new covenant. Not the old covenant. It's a new covenant. He says, in my blood. Not in the blood of an animal. Not in the blood of a, of a lamb. He says, in my blood. He says, my blood's going to be shed. So that just in the same way that, that, that God used Moses to deliver you from your slavery to Egypt, he says, now in this new covenant, I am going to set you free and deliver you from your slavery to sin. From your slavery to sin. And so he's simply saying that he was the fulfillment of all of that from the Old Testament. That all that stuff about the Passover, all of that stuff in, in Moses' day, it all was pointing to Jesus. That's why it's been said that the Old Testament concealed is really the New Testament revealed. It's been said the, the Old Testament contained is actually the New Testament explained. And so quite frankly, 
the Passover of the Old Testament was really pointing to what Jesus was going to do on the cross in the New Testament. This is why, on another occasion, John the Baptist points at Jesus. And when he points at Jesus, in John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist is saying, you know what? Jesus is the ultimate Passover sacrifice. And he, and he won't have to die every year, year after year. He will die once and for all for the sins of mankind. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. He's the Passover Lamb. The Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians 5 or 7, For Christ, our Passover Lamb is sacrificed for us. And so we have Passover past, what, what, what God did in the days of Moses. But now we have Passover present. That when we take those elements, it reminds us today of what Jesus did for us on the cross. But now with that, I want you to go back and look at verses 16 through 18. Because now we, we need to talk about Passover future. Passover future. Verse 16, Jesus says, For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup, and he gave thanks. And he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine until the kingdom of God comes. <clears throat> it's not two different times you see this phrase, kingdom of God. He says, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine until the kingdom of God comes. Now, this is talking about the future. In other words, there's, there's something about the Passover that's supposed to get us excited about our future. About our future. And by the way, when he says, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine until the kingdom of God comes, most Bible commentators agree that, that this is ultimately going to be fulfilled in Revelation chapter 19, the so-called marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 19. Now, by the way, if you don't know, in Revelation chapter 19, Jesus is the groom... But we as, as Christians, we as, as, as the body of Christ, we as the church, we collectively are the bride. Now for us to understand this picture, well, we, we have to understand what, what marriage was like in those, in those ancient times, in those ancient days. Now we know that, that marriage, just like it did in, in, in our day, marriage back in that day started off with engagement. Now in our day, you know, he goes to Jared. <laughs> he went to Jared. But in that day, it was, it was much more than that. In fact, in that day, what, what, what we call engagement, they called betrothal. Now, betrothal was really, you know, like, like engagement on steroids. <laughs> in fact, the, the betrothal process, uh, during this time, the couple legally was married. Legally, they were considered married, with, with one exception. The only exception is that they had not yet physically consummated their marriage yet. If you don't know what I just said, you're not old enough to understand. Come back in a few years and replay the tape or CD. They had not yet physically consummated the marriage yet, but they, they were legally married. Now, this, 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 this process called betrothal was a period of time that would last typically for one year. One year. Now, during this one year, this couple was to have absolutely no physical contact whatsoever. That's why they were never left alone. Everywhere they went, they were always with their families. I mean, they, everywhere they went, their families were with them 24-7. The ultimate helicopter parents. It was for their benefit. To, to protect them, to keep them pure. And so they, they, they were never left alone. And, and, and this, this period was just for them to get to know each other and know more about each other. But to not get physical. And so, and so this was called the betrothal period. But then during this one-year period, uh, both the bride and the groom had their own unique responsibilities they were in charge of. For example, the bride, it was her responsibility to, to sew and to make her own wedding dress. Now the groom, on the other hand, his responsibility goes to go and build a place for he and his bride to live. A place for his bride to live. Now, now uh, by, the uh, way, by the way, in that culture, in that culture that because that was a quote-unquote quote quote patriarchal, patriarchal society, society being, the, being the father, father was the center, the center of society. society. And so because, so because of, that, of that, 
when, when they when say when they say that the moon would go and prepare a pair of space for his life, but he would he would he would go and basically, and basically build, build, build an addition, addition on to on his, his father's house. house. But actually, but actually add, add an addition on his father's house. house. And then that and addition, addition, that would be that where he and his bride would now live. On the father's house. Now, now is that is that the father father of Rome? He also became became the chief building and building inspector. And so he would constantly inspect the house. house. And he was, house. The, and he was, was the one who was telling you when the house was finished, finished. and when it was up when to code, and when it was ready. And, ready. and then, and as he declared that it was finished, and it was complete, and it was ready, then the father of the groom was the one who would set the wedding date. And so quite literally, in those days, no one knew the day or the hour of the wedding date except for the father of the groom himself. I'm sure you're starting to see some connections here in the New Testament. Because we know that in the New Testament, you know, we're, we, that the church, we as Christians, we are the bride, right? The Bible says, for example, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He says, now, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And so Ephesians is saying, you know what? Christ is the groom, and, and the church is the bride. We're the bride. In the same way, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, he says, I promised to give you to Christ as your only husband, and I want to give you to him as a pure bride. And so the church, we are the bride. But right now, we're, we're, we're in that betrothal period. We're in that engagement period. The Bible says in, in Hosea chapter 2, verse 19, God says, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you will know the Lord. And so right now, we, we are in that, that betrothal period. And quite frankly, we as the church have been in that betrothal period ever since the cross. We're in that period where, where there's no physical contact. We're just getting to know each other. And of course, we get to know Jesus by, by reading his word, by reading the Bible. We're in that, that stage where we get to know him. But then again, this is also that stage where we each have some responsibilities. And the responsibility of the bride, remember, was to make her own wedding dress. And this is why the Bible says to clothe yourself in righteousness. To live in such a way that, that it's like clothing. You're, you're, you're making your own wedding dress. You're clothing yourself in righteousness. But then again, the groom, he has, he has a responsibility, right? It was the groom's responsibility to go and, 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 and build a place, make an addition onto his father's house for he and his bride to live. Now with that, <coughs> uh, even to this day, the, 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 the Jewish wedding ceremonies in ancient times and even up until this day, they, they have different stages in the ceremony. And at one point, there's a stage called the, the chupa. Now, the, the chupa is, is an interesting stage, and we'll talk more about it here in just a moment. But, but during this stage, uh, the, the, the groom would stand up and make an announcement. He would make an announcement to his bride, and he would declare to her, saying, I will go and make a place for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now listen, those words should sound familiar. Because after all, didn't, didn't Jesus say the same thing to us? Didn't Jesus say in John chapter 14, verse 1, he said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that, that, that you also may be where I am. Now listen, this is talking about the rapture of the church. That event where Jesus Christ, the groom, comes back to earth for his bride. And he takes his bride away from this earth back to his father's house. That his bride may be where the groom is. In his father's house at the wedding ceremony, the, the wedding supper of the Lamb. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> but again, he, he built the place. He built the house, but the Father was the one who declared it was ready. 
And the Father and the Father alone set the date for the wedding ceremony. And so literally, only the Father would know the day and the hour of his son's return. Now what's interesting is, is that even to this day, the, the, the week before the wedding ceremony, the bride and her bridesmaids would, would go to a pre-assigned location where they were to wait for her groom. And, and she was to be ready. She was to put on that dress that she just spent the last year making. And she was to wear this dress and, and, and to be ready because she didn't know the day or the hour that her, her groom was coming. But she had to be ready. If she wasn't ready, he would leave her there. And so she had to be ready in, in, in wearing that dress. And then he would come and, and he would get her and, and, and take her back to his father's house for the ceremony. And when he came back in for the ceremony, then, 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 then this would begin that stage that we mentioned earlier of the wedding ceremony. It's called the chupa. Now, the word chupa, by the way, is a Hebrew word that means canopy. And what a chupa is, or a canopy, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece of fabric, a piece of cloth that was, was decorated and, 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 and ornate. And it was used to symbolically represent the new house where the bride and the groom would live. And so, again, the groom makes this announcement and says, I will go and prepare a place for you. And then the bride comes in, and when she comes in, now they take out this cloth, this, this chupa, and they wave it up and down, and they have a dance. And then at this point, now the, the rabbi stands up, and he gives a blessing with a cup of wine. And at that point, the bride and the groom, they drink from that cup. They don't drink from the cup at any other time until this point, until the house has been prepared, until the chupa portion of the ceremony. Then they drink of that cup of blessing. Now what's interesting is, is that to the Jew uh, in, in biblical times, and even to this day, wine to them represents life, the symbol of life. They would say that, you know, wine, first of all, begins as grape juice. But then as it ferments, you know, it, it, it gets sour. You know, just, just like life sometimes can get sour and difficult and have challenges. But when, when it becomes fully fermented, then it's transformed and it becomes a new product. A new product that, that can bring you joy. And so, and so they would say it represents life. And how you live your life here and, and you have your ups and downs and your trials, but then one day it's a new product. You're transformed and you are in heaven for everlasting joy. And so in many ways, when Jesus takes this cup, I believe it was this particular cup. He says, I will not drink of this cup until the kingdom of God is fulfilled. I will not drink of this cup until the chupa, until the Father's house has a place for you, until everything is prepared. And then when I go and I bring you back to my Father's house, then we'll drink of this cup. And so in many ways, the, the, the Passover of the Old Testament really pointed to the first coming of Jesus. The Passover of the Old Testament pointed to the fact that Jesus was going to come one day and die on the cross for our sins. He would be the ultimate Passover lamb. But the communion cup of the New Testament, in many ways, points to his second coming. That just as he came the first time, he's coming back a second time. But he, when he comes back, he's coming back as the groom who's returning for his bride, that she, the bride, may be where he is forever. And so every time we take communion, every time we take the Lord's Supper, it's an object lesson. It's a memorial. It's a reminder that reminds us, yes, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. His body was pierced for our transgressions. His blood was shed to wash our sins. But not only that, it also is a reminder that he is coming back for his bride. Amen? So, Father, we thank you for, for your sacrifice, the sacrifice of your son. And, Lord Jesus, we thank you that, it, that, that your blood was shed, your body was pierced, that you became our substitute. You died in our place. You died for our sins. He who, who knew no sin became sin for, for us. You took our place, that we might have life, that we might be set free. Lord, just as you came the first time, we also know that you're coming back a second time. So we not only pray, forgive us of our sins, but we pray, Lord, come quickly. 
Help us to be ready. Help us to be clothed in righteousness. To, to be ready for that day when the groom comes. We pray this now in Jesus' name. So the ushers are going to come forward and they're going to, they're going to give you these elements. Just spend some time with the Lord. Take that, that wafer. It's not the actual body of Jesus. Drink that, that cup. It's just grape juice. But it's going to remind you of all these things we've talked about this morning. Let's worship the Lord.